again, friends, this will be a talk on everybody's favorite topic, and that is diarrhea. So again, uh, if you've been following some of my talks lately, I've been going over and re-recording, updating some uh, of my videos, mostly because we've had some issues with sound. Uh, for some reason, when I upload the videos, uh, they have sound, and then at some point they lose sound. I've been talking with people at YouTube. They seem to be pretty perplexed as to why this is happening. So in any case, uh, we'll do an update here. Not a whole lot has changed except for one uh, particular test that is sort of new and up and coming, uh, which we'll get to in a little bit. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing to my Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash pwpmd. You can get there by clicking the link below in the description of the video or on the I button on the upper right hand corner of the video and it should link you up. If you can consider chipping in a dollar a month, a little bit goes a long way to help keep these videos free. If you subscribe, you'll have access to some of my premium videos in which I go over case studies, formulating differential diagnosis, treatment plan. Uh, things that will come in handy for you uh, as you gear up to study for steps two and three of the USMLE and in particular uh, those clinical case scenarios in step three. You'll want to have a really good systematic way of going about things, organizing your thoughts and uh, action plans because as you know it is not a multiple choice test. So thank you very much in advance for your consideration and now without further ado let's talk about diarrhea. So diarrhea is, as you probably are aware, as most people are aware, it's an increased volume or frequency of stool, generally of a more liquid consistency. There are, believe it or not, guidelines that are put out uh, giving a very academic description of diarrhea. However, it's pretty common sense. So those guidelines are three or more loose liquid stools per 24 hours and or stools that are more frequent than what is normal for the individual and or stool weight greater than 200 grams per day. Are you gonna have a patient go home and say, oh, I, I, I think I have diarrhea. Oh, no, you go home, <laughs> poop in a cup and measure it and see if it's more than 200 grams. No, I think this is totally useless, but uh, you know, that's what they put out. So increased volume or uh, frequency of stool, usually more liquid. There are a variety of causes as we're going to get into, uh, bacterial causes, uh, ischemic causes, metabolic causes, uh, causes that are related to a tumor, um, autoimmune causes, so tons of different causes, but the most common is idiopathic or viral, far and away the most common. Um, most of the time it's self-limited, so you really don't need to do a workup, but the USMLE is going to test you on doing a workup, uh, particularly step two. So that's why we're going into this. But in real life, most of the time, you're going to send these patients home, say, come back uh, if it doesn't go away. The most important first step to do, though, in anybody, in any case, is to assess the fluid status of the patient. So if they are hypovolemic, if they've got dizziness, or they've fallen, or their blood pressure is low, or they get dizzy when they stand up, or if they're in very uh, bad pain, they have a fever, uh, abdominal tenderness, then these are patients who should be admitted. In any case, if a patient comes into the ER, for instance, or if they come into urgent care and they're really hypotensive, or they have signs or symptoms of hypotension, you need to give them fluids, especially if they can't tolerate fluids if they also have a concomitant uh, vomiting, which does occur in a lot of cases for some reason. Uh, don't be afraid to give IV fluids. Uh, if that is uh, something that you deem necessary. Patients who have real bad pain, fever, bad tenderness, these are patients who should be admitted. Uh, but far and away, most patients with diarrhea do not need to be admitted. If the most uh, that you will probably do is uh, get stool uh, uh, studies. Uh, so we'll get into why we do that. As I said, hypotensive patients should immediately get a normal saline bolus, uh, so that's your fluids. Diarrhea can be acute, persistent, or chronic. Um, so acute diarrhea is gonna be anything that's lasted less than two weeks. Persistent is gonna be more than two weeks. Chronic is gonna be more than four weeks. I lump in persistent and chronic because thing, uh, there's really not a different differential between persistent and chronic. Um, so we'll talk about acute and then we'll talk about persistent slash chronic. 
In acute diarrhea, you always need to exclude infectious causes. And what's going to be your number one cause of infectious diarrhea? It's going to be viral diarrhea. There are bacterial causes. There are parasitic causes, which are very rare. Um, but there are a variety of infectious causes, and we need to exclude those first. So we're going to talk about uh, the variety of infectious causes of diarrhea, which can cause bloody diarrhea or non-bloody diarrhea, and that's going to be something you want to know. Is there blood? Sometimes a patient won't know. Uh, if there's, most patients assume bloody diarrhea is going to be red stool. And we know that that's not always true. It can be black. It can be uh, it can be normal colored, but there's still blood in there, and that's why we do our stool studies. So you want to know if it's bloody or non-bloody. You, you're going to have different differential depending on whether it's bloody or non-bloody. There's also the antibiotic associated diarrhea, uh, which you should be familiar with if you ever have worked in a hospital. And then lactose intolerance uh, would fall under acute diarrhea, but it tends to be more persistent and protracted with time because this is a chronic condition, but it leads to a, an acute diarrhea. So the first question that should be on your mind is whether or not this is bloody diarrhea. And this is very straightforward. Um, all you need to do to find out if it's bloody diarrhea is to get your stool studies. So what are stool studies? Well, there's a lot of different things that we can do to the stool. Uh, so we get a sample, and then you can run all sorts of tests. And, you know, if you've ever worked in gastroenterology with a gastroenterologist, you'll see they get a stool sample and they just run this battery of tests. Are they all necessary? Probably not. You could probably go uh, by you know, the patient's symptoms, their, their, you know, who this patient is, their history, and, and choose from these. But, you know, this is what the gastroenterologists do. They like to run a battery of tests, so I don't think you would be wrong on uh, step three uh, clinical case scenarios if you were to run all these. In any case, I want to talk about these because uh, they, do have, they do pertain to all of the things on our differential that we're going to talk about. So far and away, the most common uh, and important one to get is your stool lactoferrin. And your stool lactoferrin really just tells you if it's bloody diarrhea or not. Now, you would think, well, wouldn't that be red blood cells? Well, it really doesn't matter. Uh, so white blood cells will, uh, will tell you if it's a bloody diarrhea, but it also tells you if, if it's an inflammatory diarrhea. So usually if there's white blood cells present, in other words, your stool lactoferrin is positive, then there's probably already red blood cells too because you have an inflammatory process and that's going to cause all sorts of blood cells to get into the stool. So please remember that stool lactoferrin positive is the same as white blood cells positive. And you'll never get a stool white blood cell test. You'll get a stool lactoferrin test, and it's the same thing. So that's testing for blood. OVA and parasites, also known as ONP, is looking fair for, what do you think? Parasites. And then the things that parasites leave behind, which are eggs. Uh, or you can get Giardia antigen. Giardia is a parasite, uh, and so you can get an antigen just for that. You can do culture. Drawback for culture is that it takes a couple days for it to come back. So you're not always going to find that to be very useful. A new thing that we've got in our uh, armamentarium is the stool PCR. And I suppose this has been out for a lot longer, uh, probably going back even longer than when I first did this lecture in 2013, uh, but it's becoming more and more commonly used. And that's the stool PCR, and it can look for a wide variety of infectious agents, and they just test all of them, uh, or a lot of them. And that can give you uh, a faster result than your culture would give you. So it's kind of supplanting culture. C. diff toxin is going to be useful. Now, do you need to do C. diff toxin on a person who's not been on antibiotics in the past you know, several weeks? No, you really don't. C. diff toxin is something, though, that you would want to get on a patient who, let's say they were on amoxicillin last week, and now they come in with diarrhea. Absolutely, you get a C. diff toxin, so use your clinical judgment there. Stool osmotic gap is useful, especially when we're talking about the chronic diarrheas. Um, there are, there's two different kinds of diarrheas. There's a secretory diarrhea and an osmotic diarrhea. Uh, the, a lot of the infections that we talk about fall into the category of secretory diarrhea. And then some of the other more chronic conditions, like celiac disease, lactose intolerance, 
uh, osmotic laxative use fall under the category of osmotic diarrhea. And I don't think that the USMLE is going to test you on uh, the exact numbers for stool osmotic gap, uh, but if you want to write it down, it's probably pretty low yield, but I'll just tell you the, the normal stool osmotic gap is between 50 and 100 milliosmoles per kilogram, and uh, some sources have cited at 50 to 125. So I would probably write that one down since, um, you know, there's disagreement. Uh, a low stool osmotic gap is going to be a secretory diarrhea, and a high uh, osmotic gap is going to be an osmotic diarrhea. And we'll get into that a little bit more when we talk about the chronic diarrheas. And then other tests could be warranted depending on any other symptoms that may appear. You may get a CBC if the patient looks sick. You might get a BMP. Uh, you could get blood cultures if they appear toxic. So again, just really using your, your clinical judgment. But bare bones here, stool studies. So the different types of, or different causes of bloody diarrhea. Remember that bloody diarrhea is a positive stool lactoferrin. And there are a variety of causes of infectious bloody diarrhea. Now, is this all of them? No, these are the causes of acute bloody diarrhea. So they were fine uh, a week ago, and now in the last few days, they've had diarrhea, and you've got your stool studies, and they've come back positive for stool lactoferrin. This is not a patient who's been having diarrhea off and on for the last you know, year. That would be chronic. This is a, these are acute bloody diarrheas. And you can see that most commonly it's going to be infectious. Are any of these viruses? No. Viruses will not cause bloody diarrhea. Viruses always cause non-bloody diarrhea. And remember that viruses are the most common known cause of diarrhea, of acute diarrhea. Okay, so the most common causes of bloody diarrhea. So you get a positive stool lactoferrin, and this is an acute bloody diarrhea. It came on last week. Are Salmonella and Campylobacter. So where do we get salmonella and campylobacter from? Most commonly, it's going to be poultry, eggs, and milk. And these you commonly see uh, with uh, these outbreaks. Uh, most recently, uh, within the last month, I think they traced romaine lettuce. I think it was a salmonella outbreak. Um, so you see that every now and then. Uh, but you can have isolated cases, certainly. Um, so uh, salmonella and campylobacter. Please remember also uh, that Campylobacter is associated with Guillain-Barre syndrome as well as reactive arthritis. Um, so Guillain-Barre syndrome, remember that ascending paralysis. Uh, so look for in uh, in a patient's history uh, what they what they might tell you. Let's say on a USMLE style question, is a, a patient uh, has got ascending paralysis and then two weeks ago they had had this self-resolved diarrhea, uh, what's the most likely uh, cause of that diarrhea? And that would be Campylobacter. So Campylobacter infection has an association with Guillain-Barre syndrome and they could write the same exact question for uh, re reactive arthritis, also known as Reiter's syndrome. Okay. Uh, e. coli 0157H7 is associated with the development of the hemolytic uremic syndrome, uh, so especially in children. So look for diarrhea, and then now they're jaundiced, and you get a CBC, and you find out that their platelets are low. And that is because hemolytic uremic syndrome is associated with thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, TTP. So in a patient with presumptive hemolytic uremic syndrome, you get your CBC, you find out their platelets are low, what are you going to do? Are you going to give antibiotics? Typically, you don't. You want to avoid antibiotics in a patient with diarrhea. The, uh, the bowel is very good at getting rid of this stuff, but absolutely, in a patient who has hemolytic uremic syndrome in conjunction with diarrhea, you will never, ever, 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 ever give antibiotics to these patients, ever. Would you give them platelets? Their platelets are low. In some patients, if their platelets are low, you might give them platelets. Not in these patients. You do not give them platelets. So you got a patient, and this just goes for any kind of uh, HUSTTP, um, for thrombocytic, uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Giving them platelets is a bad idea. Why? Because one of the big problems with TTP is that they form these platelet fibrin aggregates, and these platelet platelet fibrin aggregates 
cause small vessel obstruction. And that's really bad. It's bad for your kidneys. It's bad for all sorts of organs. Uh, if you give them more platelets, they're going to form more of those aggregates. And we don't want that. So we are not going to give these patients platelets. So that's just a little side with HUSTTP. E. coli 0157H7 can cause diarrhea. It can also cause hemolytic uremic syndrome and TTP. Okay. Uh, Vibrio parahemolyticus is associated with shellfish consumption. Uh, Vibrio parahemolyticus and vulnificus, I believe they can both cause like a gangrene, uh, but that's if it gets into an open wound, that would be a lot different. So this is with consumption and it's associated with shellfish consumption. So oysters and crabs, I, I think crabs are shellfish, right? Um, I, am, I am certainly not an animal science person. <laughs> I only know the human animal, so um, so shellfish consumption, uh, oysters and shrimp and stuff like that. Vibrio vulnificus is similar to parahemolyticus, but with Vibrio vulnificus, there's an increased incidence in patients with liver disease or in a high iron state. And the reason for that is Vibrio vulnificus, it thrives on iron. So when you've got a patient with a high, high iron state, um, they're more likely to get Vibrio vulnificus, but those two are quite rare. Okay, so bloody diarrhea, what do we do for treatment? Well, if the patient is stable, you can observe and just do fluid replacement uh, as needed. If the symptoms are severe and you know that they do not have hemolytic uremic syndrome, then you can do antibiotics. Typically, these are going to be the patients who have severe enough symptoms to where they need to be admitted. Uh, do not wait for a culture. You're going to treat empirically. Is it good to have a culture? Well, it can be useful because let's say that, um, you know, your antibiotics aren't working, then you could tailor a different antibiotic. But you're going to start antibiotics prior to uh, the culture coming back. So if the symptoms are severe, you can do oral ciprofloxacin or another fluoroquinolone, and you may or may not add metronidazole or flagyl to that. If the history happens to point to Vibrio vulnificus, so they said, yeah, I was eating oysters and clams, and you know, three days later, two days later, I wound up with this diarrhea, and oh, by the way, you know, I've got a history of hep C. Then that points to Vibrio vulnificus, use doxycycline. How many times have I seen Vibrio vulnificus in my career? Zero times. Uh, but how many times have I seen it come up in the USMLE? A few times. So that may be something to put in your back pocket. So Vibrio vulnificus, doxycycline. Do not, as I said, use antibiotics in a patient with hemolytic uremic syndrome. Most cases of bloody diarrhea are going to be self-limited. Uh, also, do note ischemic bowel disease. I talk about this in the surgery section, but it is a cause of bloody diarrhea, so I do just want to bring it up. Look for a history, of, you got an older patient with a history of hypercoagulation or AFib who can throw clots. Pain will be a prominent sign. They're going to come in, they're going to look nasty and sick. They're going to be in pain, they're going to be miserable. Uh, you get your CBC, they're going to have an elevated white count. You might be thinking infection, uh, not so fast. Uh, you want to get an abdominal x-ray in those people. Uh, and the abdominal x-ray uh, will show you air fluid levels, uh, bowel thickening, that thumbprint sign. Again, I talk about this in the surgery section, so you can go back there uh, if you want. Okay, so non-bloody diarrhea. This is going to be a negative stool, lactoferrin. And so the one big cause that always seems to come up on the USMLE, I don't know why because it's not very common, is Giardia, Giardia lamblia. And it has an association with camping or consumption of stream water. So you've got a 25-year-old otherwise healthy guy who went on a camping trip with his buddies and they decided, oh, look at that stream water. That looks really nice. I'm going to have a drink of that. It looks so clean and pristine. And then a couple days later, they all are bloated and full of diarrhea. That's Giardia lamblia. You can also get it from oral anal sexual contact, but that presumes that one of the partners, assuming the probably the one whose anus is being contacted, has Giardia. And so that's not as common because, you know, do you really want somebody licking your anus if you have diarrhea? I mean, I don't know. But hey, I wouldn't put it past anyone. So oral anal sexual contact. Giardia lamblia is associated with very, very severe bloating. 
uh, if you get your stool studies, you're going to note positive ovum parasites or a positive GRD antigen. Do you think the USMLE is going to say, here's your, your vignette, and they went camping, and then you got tests, and it was a positive GRD antigen. Which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's diarrhea? A, GRD. No, they're not going to give it to you like that. Uh, so look for positive ova and parasites as your, your clue for giardiasis, uh, along with the, maybe the camping and the stream water and stuff like that. But in practice, giardia antigen is something that you can go to. Bacillus cereus is associated with Chinese takeout food, particularly reheated fried rice. Again, another little buzz phrase uh, that the USMLE may throw at you. You got a patient with diarrhea, and by the way, two days ago they had Chinese food, and then they put it in the fridge, and they heated it back up, and it was fried rice. And not only now do they have diarrhea, but they also have vomiting. This is uh, Bacillus cereus, so vomiting plus diarrhea. Staph aureus is associated with dairy, coleslaw, picnics, really anything with like uh, dairy. Um, that So we're talking like coleslaw, potato salad, mayonnaise, uh, and this stuff gets left out. So you see this a lot in the summer because people have their picnics and they leave the coleslaw out for five, six hours. And then it's like, hmm, I'm going to go get seconds. And you go and eat the coleslaw and now you've got uh, vomiting and diarrhea. And this will oftentimes show up in like little mini outbreaks. So a few people that were at the office uh, picnic later show up with uh, vomiting and diarrhea. Again, Staph aureus along with B. cereus, both are uh, foodborne, but they also both have vomiting in, in conjunction with diarrhea. Clostridium perfringens is associated with meat that's been sitting out too long. So Clostridium perfringens, meat, Staph aureus, dairy. Be serious, Chinese food. And I'm not saying that this is the only way you can get these. I'm saying that on the USMLE, that's the way they like to present these. Listeria monocytogenes. Uh, listeriosis can come from a lot of things. That's, again, another one of those uh, foodborne illnesses that tend to be in outbreaks where you get those recalls of, like, you know, lettuce or cereal or whatever. Um, listeria is not very common, but there is an increased incidence in pregnancy. For some reason, uh, pregnant women have a higher uh, rate compared to the general population. That probably has to do with the fact that pregnant women, uh, their immune system kind of uh, drops a little bit to support the, uh, the embryo and the fetus. Uh, so there is an increased incidence in pregnancy. I did look up the recommendations from ACOG, and ACOG says treat uh, women, pregnant women with listeriosis the same way you would treat anybody else with listeriosis. Cryptosporidium and Isospora belly are associated with AIDS. Uh, so a patient with a history of HIV who hasn't been taking their therapy and their CD4 count is now uh, down. Uh, so any patient with a history of HIV who comes in with diarrhea, you're going to want to get a CD4 count just to see if their CD4 count is uh, low. Because if it is, then you've now added two things to their differential. If you've got an HIV patient, their CD4 count's 500, uh, then you're looking at the other causes. So do keep that in mind because the USMLE might throw that at you. You've got an HIV patient with diarrhea, and they're going to try to trick you and make you go towards these HIV-associated uh, infectious causes, but in a healthy HIV patient, the things that cause diarrhea in them are the same things that cause it in everybody else. Um, so don't get tripped up by that. But if they are in the over-AIDS uh, category, then you need to consider things like Cryptosporidium and Isospora belly. Both of these are parasites, uh, so they're both uh, going to have a positive ova and parasites, as far as I know. I've never diagnosed someone with these. Um, uh, but with cryptosporidium, cryptosporidosis, in addition, when you get their, you know, their, their diagnostic workup, uh, with cryptosporidosis, they're going to have an elevated elk foss. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And then with isospora belly on their CDC, they will have a high eosinophil. Uh, count. So those are two things that, uh, again, 99th percentile stuff for the USMLE. But you want to know cryptosporidium and isospora belly are infectious causes associated with patients with AIDS, not just HIV, AIDS. And then 
I don't know why I saved this for last, but the viral causes. These are the most common causes of non-bloody diarrhea, and that's the rotavirus and norovirus. Rotavirus is probably the most common. Uh, norovirus tends to show up in outbreaks, like on cruise ships. Okay. Oh, and by the way, with cryptosporidium and isospora, um, you can get the acid fast test or ova and parasites. Both of those will show up positive. Uh, so acid fast test would not be part of your general workup on uh, your, your stool sample, but, you know, if, again, if you have an AIDS patient, you may want to add that in. Okay. So the treatment for non-bloody diarrhea is the same for bloody diarrhea, believe it or not. If the patient's stable, uh, just observe and do fluid replacement as necessary. If the symptoms are severe, then you can do antibiotics. Again, don't wait for the culture. So if you got severe symptoms, same as the bloody diarrhea, empiric treatment, uh, oral ciprofloxacin, plus or minus metronidazole. If you have a pregnant woman with severe symptoms, then you need to uh, consider that she may have listeria. So you can do IV ampicillin. And it is IV. Uh, so I did look that up. It is IV ampicillin. If you have an AIDS patient, uh, you want to get uh, you you want to know uh, what their CD4 count is, and then if their CD4 count is low, you want to get them on the highly active antiretroviral therapy. And a lot of these patients are probably not compliant, so you want to get them on that to get their CD4 counts above 100. If you just do that, that will typically be enough. So you don't need to go to antibiotics for these patients. Just go for the antiretroviral therapy get their CD4 counts up, and that should take care of it. If it's isospora belly, and again, they, it's severe, and they've got symptoms, and you need to hospitalize them, uh, then you can use trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. Again, most cases of non-bloody diarrhea are self-limited. Outpatient management. This is going to be most people. So you say, okay, yeah, you've got diarrhea. You look all right. You know, they'll usually say, yeah, I want to get back to work. You know, I just going to manage this at home. I don't want to be hospitalized. Remind the patient of the importance of adequate hydration. Recommend things like Gatorade, Pedialyte, other isotonic drinks. They're definitely preferable to water because these patients are losing electrolytes in addition to water, so you need to replace that too. No shame in going for Pedialyte, even if you're an adult. It's really good stuff. Um, it replaces the glucose and the uh, electrolytes and stuff, but you know these isotonic beverages are great. Uh, any hydration, though, is better than none. Uh, educate them on basic food safety education. Do not leave food out. Uh, don't reheat fried rice. <laughs> Things like that. Uh, wash your hands. Return to clinic if the diarrhea has gone on for more than two weeks. In that case, we do need to work them up for a chronic cause. The antibiotic-associated diarrhea comes up occasionally on the USMLE, and it's something that you need to be aware of. So antibiotic-associated diarrhea is caused by Clostridioides difficile, and yes, I did say Clostridioides. It was renamed from Clostridium difficile to now Clostridioides difficile. Same, same thing, though. Very common in hospitals. Remember that we're going from patient to patient. We are vectors as healthcare workers. We are vectors for uh, Clostridioides clostridioides, and we can carry that from one patient to the next. So that's why, as you know, if you have a patient with confirmed clostridioides difficile or possible clostridioides difficile, you have to gown up before you go in there and then take that gown off so that you're not tracking it in from one patient to the next because anybody who's on antibiotics is at risk for C. diff. C. diff uh, is, uh, so what's going to happen, not only can C. diff uh, naturally exist and it's competed out, uh, which is a good thing. Once you have antibiotics, though, uh, the uh, if you have antibiotics, you're going to kill off some of your normal flora in your colon, and then that allows the C. diff uh, to uh, thrive. And so there's only a few antibiotics that can knock out C. diff. So taking antibiotics and disturbing your, your uh, colonic flora can be a, a bad thing. Um, so that's what this is caused by. It's an overgrowth of C. diff in the large bowel, and it forms sort of a plaque in the large bowel, and that prevents absorption of fluids. Any antibiotic can precipitate it, but clindamycin tends to be a common one, and clindamycin is not an uncommon antibiotic to be given, especially in 
uh, the, the hospital. You want to suspect any patient who's on antibiotics who presents with diarrhea. Now, antibiotics themselves can cause diarrhea just as a side effect, uh, but any patient who's got bad diarrhea who's been on or is on antibiotics, you need to be aware of this. Diagnosis, you get your stool studies, the C. diff toxin will be positive. The treatment is oral metronidazole. Now, with metronidazole, if the symptoms do not go away after two days, then administer oral vancomycin. So metronidazole is your first choice. If it doesn't go away on metronidazole after a few days, then go to vancomycin. Both are going to be oral. Why oral? Because metronidazole and vancomycin are not going to, if you give it IV, it's not going to cross into the bowel, and that's where this, this problematic bacteria is. So you need to give it uh, orally so it gets into the uh, large bowel. Complications of C. diff are toxic megacolon and perforation, and I talk about that in the surgery section, so we're not going to go into that here. Lactose intolerance. This is pretty common, so a very high frequency in the general population. Lactase is an enzyme that we make genetically, and it's needed to break down lactose, uh, which remember is a uh, two sugar, um, a two sugar uh, carbohydrate, and uh, it's broken down into glucose and galactose. And you cannot absorb lactose. You can only absorb glucose or galactose. So you can't, it, lactose is too big and bulky to absorb it. So you need lactase to break down lactose, and lactose is found in dairy products. So if you don't have lactase, then you're going to have lactose sitting around in your large bowel. And what's going to happen to that lactose? Well, the bacteria are going to find it, and they're going to be like, mmm, that looks tasty. I'm going to eat that. And in the process, those bacteria make CO2 gas, and then it leaves glucose and galactose. Can your large bowel absorb glucose and galactose? No, it cannot. So that glucose and galactose now is going to sit around and it's going to act as an osmotic. And so it's going to pull water and hold water in the large bowel. Now, that's a problem because normally that water shouldn't be there. Water should get reabsorbed in the large bowel. But if you have sugar there, it's not going to happen. So you're going to have extra sugars and extra water, and that's going to reflect on your stool osmotic gap. So the diagnostic giveaway is going to be the elevated stool uh, osmotic gap, and that will be reflected in your stool studies. And this is going to be an otherwise healthy patient. They just have diarrhea. And a lot of times these patients will know that it's, it comes on when they have milk or dairy products. A lot of times they'll diagnose this in children uh, when it first comes on, and then they'll just know they have lactose intolerance. They need to avoid dairy. And that is the treatment. So avoidance of dairy. And notice I put diagnosis and treatment. There's really no special tests for lactose intolerance. Uh, what you do is, you know, you see that they've got an elevated stool osmolar gap, or they've got this ongoing diarrhea, intermittent. Um, and what you tell them to do is, okay, avoid dairy. Don't drink milk. Uh, stay away from certain cheeses and see if that makes it go away. And most of the time it does. Within one or two days, the diarrhea goes away. And if they try drinking milk again, then it comes back. Uh, and that's pretty diagnostic. So you want them to avoid dairy, but if they must, if they really want, you know, that, an ice cream sandwich or something, uh, then there are over-the-counter lactase supplements that can provide them with the lactase enzyme that they need to break that down, and that should uh, be effective. Okay, so persistent and chronic diarrheas. I address all these in different lectures, with the exception of carcinoid syndrome, which I think I did go over in one of the surgery talks. But in any case, here are some of your common causes of persistent and chronic diarrhea. This is diarrhea lasting more than two weeks. So irritable bowel syndrome is very common, uh, and there's a growing awareness, and it's really kind of the idiopathic sink that we dump all uh, causes of chronic diarrhea as well as constipation if we just really don't know what's causing it. So irritable bowel syndrome... Uh, IBSD, the diarrhea variant of IBS, is chronic diarrhea, which is often associated, primarily associated with pain. And uh, often the IBS will remit at night, although not always. And 
almost always it's relieved by a bowel movement. So these patients, they get pain, they go to the bathroom, they have diarrhea, and now they feel better. And then it just goes on and on, and it's a big problem for these patients. So look for diarrhea associated with pain that gets better with a bowel movement, and it's been going on for a long time. They've been having this, you know, for years. Inflammatory bowel disease, as you know, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease. Uh, this is relatively straightforward diagnosis. Usually you need a colonoscopy, though. This is chronic bloody diarrhea, and there's not many things that cause chronic bloody diarrhea. There are a lot of things that cause chronic diarrhea, but they shouldn't be bloody. So this is chronic bloody diarrhea. You get these patients in, you know, they got diarrhea, you get your stool study, and you see positive lactoferrin. And then they come in three weeks later, positive lactoferrin. And they come in two months later, positive lactoferrin. This is chronic bloody diarrhea, and this is inflammatory, and it is also associated with other extraintestinal signs like fever, uh, joint issues, skin issues, uh, especially when we're talking about Crohn's. Uh, so uh, the inflammatory bowel disease, not only is it chronic inflammatory bloody diarrhea, but they also have systemic signs. They may have on your CBC, you may see uh, an anemia. That would be the anemia of chronic disease. So this is a systemic syndrome, not just diarrhea, but other things too. Lactose intolerance, we already talked about that. Malabsorption, so chronic diarrhea, positive for fecal fat. They're not absorbing things in their small bowel. And now they're getting fat and other things into the large bowel where it cannot be absorbed. And that's going to draw water into the large bowel or prevent water from getting out, from being absorbed. So again, you're going to have a high stool osmotic gap. But the difference is with malabsorption, they're not absorbing fat in their small bowel. And consequently, you're going to have a positive fecal fat. Uh, the most common cause... Uh, I venture to say the most common cause, but a big cause is celiac disease. Now, because this is positive fecal fat, because this is malabsorption, they're going to have issues with absorbing vitamins to some degree. And we see that a lot with patients with cystic fibrosis. Um, another thing that you could see is weight loss. If they're not absorbing fat, they're not getting as much nutrients. Remember, fat is nine calories per uh, gram. So that's a lot of nutrients that you're missing out on. A lot of calories, so they may have weight loss. I had a friend, uh, have a friend with uh, celiac disease, and he uh, was always just thin, super thin and pale as a ghost, constantly looked sick. And he practically looked like he had cancer all the time. And, you know, I thought, well, he was a law student, and maybe it was because you know, he's just not eating properly, but he came back and uh, he still just looked awful. And then... This started getting worse. He started having vomiting and stuff, wound up being celiac disease. Cut the gluten out. The guy gained like 40 pounds over the summer. Now he's kind of a little fatty, but uh, <laughs> we won't, uh, I, I won't give him too much trouble for it because celiac disease is really awful. Uh, so just to let you know, uh, to diagnose celiac disease, you can try a trial gluten-free diet. So, uh, you know, if you don't have any of this testing stuff on hand, you can say, why don't you cut out gluten from your diet? And that's challenging, so you'll need to give them some education on that. Usually there's brochures. And then see if maybe four, five, six weeks uh, it's gone away. Well, then that would be a pretty good indicator. But there are lab tests you can do, and you'll want to know this for the USMLE. There's the anti-tissue transglutaminase, which is an IgA. There's also anti-gliadin, which is IgA and IgG. Or you can do a small bowel biopsy. Now, usually you'd like to do these blood tests first, but a small bowel biopsy is definitive. Uh, what would you see on small bowel biopsy? You don't need to know for step two or step three. Uh, but if you are one of those people that watch my videos and you're going to be taking step one, I will just let you know. You will see positive intraepithelial lymphocytes, indicating the inflammatory nature of this. Uh, villus atrophy because of the chronic inflammation, and crypt hyperplasia. Okay, and then finally, carcinoid syndrome, which I believe we talked about here. So uh, carcinoid syndrome is kind of a zebra. I've never seen it in my life, uh, but it does get tested on the USMLE for some reason. And it's chronic diarrhea caused by a serotonin-secreting tumor. So serotonin secreting tumors are going to cause other things because serotonin doesn't just work in our gut, it works elsewhere. Now think about serotonin. What are one of the things that we give 
that cause diarrhea that also increases serotonin. SSRIs. And when you put a patient, a depressed patient on an SSRI, one of the first things they're going to notice within a few days after starting treatment is they got diarrhea. And that's because of serotonin. Serotonin promotes diarrhea. Carcinoid syndrome is a serotonin secreting tumor. Not only because of the high levels of serotonin, not only is it going to cause diarrhea, but it can also cause some of these other symptoms that are associated with uh, high levels of serotonin. Flushing, tachycardia, hypotension, all right, so very, 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 very uh, unique constellation of symptoms. The serotonin secreting tumor can really be anywhere, but it's very commonly present in uh, the appendix, the small bowel, and the bronchi. Who is more likely to get carcinoid syndrome, uh, one of these, uh, these tumors? People with multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1. So remember, that's the pituitary, parathyroid, and pancreas. Uh, so that... I highly doubt they would go this deep on the USMLE, but that's uh, those patients are at increased risk for serotonin secreting tumors. Okay, so you have a patient with chronic diarrhea, wheezing, flushing, uh, bouts of low blood pressure, tachycardia. If you think carcinoid syndrome, then your way to diagnose it, to nail down the diagnosis, is a urinary 5-HIAA. And HIAA just stands for hydroxyindoleacetic acid. And this is a byproduct of uh, serotonin that gets excreted in the urine. If you have an elevated 5-HIAA level, then you have elevated serotonin in your blood, and that is diagnostic for carcinoid syndrome. The treatment for carcinoid syndrome is octreotide, and it basically just works as an antagonist. We don't, it, it's very difficult to get rid of these tumors, so we just treat this uh, by, uh, by blocking the effects of the serotonin. So octreotide is our treatment of choice for carcinoid syndrome. All right, and one more thing that I do want to bring up really quickly, uh, I'm not going to go back to the slide, but I just want to bring up that another possible cause of foodborne um, uh, diarrhea is hepatitis A. Uh, so do keep that in mind. Again, when you're getting your work up, uh, if you look at liver function tests and they're all elevated and this is an otherwise healthy person, consider the possibility of hepatitis A. Get your hepatitis A IgM. Uh, so I didn't bring that up in the infectious causes. It is a viral cause of diarrhea. These are going to be patients that also present with right upper quadrant pain. Okay, uh, with that, that is all I've got for you. If you have any questions, please write me a note below. Otherwise, I will see you next time.